And um, yeah, we're really lucky to uh, round out the session of, of webinars with a presentation from uh, Lawrence McIntosh from the Institute for Sustainable Futures. Um, Lawrence, are you, are you there? How are you doing there, Laurie? I think I'm here now. Can you hear me, Tom? Yes, I can. And do you want to turn on your video as well? Video. Wonderful. Hello, everybody. So, um, yeah, so uh, we'll do a bit of housekeeping first. Um, we are going to um, do a and a session at the, end, at the end of the presentation today. However, if you do have a question that pops up during Lawrence's presentation, please do pop a question into the Q&A uh, panel. Um, mark it as, as urgent and I will, interrupt, I will interrupt Laurie if it's a question that's preventing you from understanding what's, what's going on and moving forward. Start to familiarise familiarize yourselves with the Q&A panel um, and there's also a chat panel, so feel free to, to, to make comments in the chat panel and I'll be here looking after that side of the, the webinar. Um, but yeah, without any further ado, over to you, uh, Laurie, to step us through the Network Opportunity Mapping Project and the, the launch of, the, of this exciting, exciting resource. Thank you, Tom, and welcome, everybody. Um, as, as Tom mentioned, I'm from the Institute for Sustainable Futures, and uh, we've spent a good portion of the last couple of years working on resources to help people find the right sites for renewable energy. And really, that's what I'm going to focus on uh, with you all today. And I'm going to go a little bit beyond just what we've been working on to introduce you also to other tools, tips and tricks for finding the right site for your renewable energy project. Um, I think that's, you know, what, while we think our tool's good, I think it should be used as part of a suite of, um, of things that you might have available to you to help you find that right site. Now, I'll just begin a, um, the slideshow. So just bear with me a second. I'm fairly new to this software. Um, that I believe is visible to you all. Looks good. Yeah. Wonderful. And Tom, I may need your assistance in starting the polls or I yeah, might have I've to do got that. that ready to go, yeah. And we'll, essentially what I'm gonna do very early on is just try to understand a little bit about um, who's with us on the webinar this evening and to make sure I can tailor it a little bit to what um, you uh, might need as a group in terms of finding the right um, renewable energy site. Um, and it's going to be largely, of course, around um, the right sites for community renewable projects. Uh, so I'd actually like to kick off that, um, that first poll now, if you would, Tom, and I really just want to suss out, um, I want to understand what kinds of projects you're looking for, and I want to understand um, also the size and scale of them. So I, I think, Tom, if you could pick up, pick up the first one, we'll do the first two just right at the front here. Yep. That should have come up on people's screens now. Uh, you won't you won't see it, Laurie, because I didn't That's allow okay. panelists to vote. But um, uh, the results are coming in. Good bit of technology. A couple more to come in now. a bit like a pollster running a political campaign, Tom. I've got to say, it's exciting. I'm wondering, wondering how the votes are going to land. <laughs> That's right. Um, we may also, uh, you, because we're in Australia, we have a um, uh, you know compulsory voting system. We might have to keep a record if you didn't vote and send out some fines because of what I've uh, got five of seven so far and uh, those last two seem to be taking a while to come in. Uh -huh. uh, Sure, people, someone out there is struggling with the technology, so we'll just keep Oh, look, I am too. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Someone's just made a comment that they're a GIS specialist rather than the community energy proponent. Um, okay, oh, look, that's really excellent to have you along. Um, yeah, that's really exciting, actually. You might, you might know a fair bit about more um, technical details of this than I do. So, um, yeah, that's really exciting. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining. All right, I'm going to end this poll. So sorry if someone was there struggling to get their vote in, but we need to move on. 
Um, and I think the results come through. Share results. There we go. So, will I be able to see those too, Tom? Yeah, that should come up on your screen any minute now. Oh, here we go. Yes. All right. So we've got um, we've got a little bit of. Uh, you actually might be able to see my own screen now. But essentially, um, a few projects or most projects really up up to a megawatt, um, and some as small as, as sort of you know domestic or small commercial scale. Um, and then there's one person that's interested in 30 megawatts plus. Okay, excellent. So maybe a, maybe a twin peaks distribution there. Yep. Right. Um, and <clears throat> maybe that's a, well, I'll, I'll be definitely, I think, focusing then on for this um, day, most of the smaller scale end of the spectrum. Um, and I think also potentially relevant is just for me to get a bit of an idea. Um, if you were to Tom, please run the second poll. Okay. Um, just to get, so this poll is about understanding um, where you're up to in that site selection uh, process. Uh, and look, you might have a few different sites, you might only have one, but just for me to get an understanding about what kind of, of process you've followed and maybe where you're up to in that process. So if, Tom, if you could kick off that next poll as well, and this okay. will just help me tailor the rest of the talk so that I'm making sure I'm capturing the right, um, I guess the right challenges that you're up to right now. Yep. Just a couple more votes to come in. Thanks, Tom. Leave it. I bet you. Um, bet you none of none of you thought we'd be so interactive. So uh, <laughs> it's actually almost like you're presenting the webinar and uh, we're just listening to you. But um, look, uh, thanks very much for filling those out, guys. It will help us sort of make sure we tailor it um, correctly for what you're needing. And it's it's also just good to sort of know where um where all the projects in Australia are up to, or all the projects that are dialed in today. So it's really exciting news. There you go, Laurie. You've just shared the results. Hey, wonderful. All right. So look, about half people are just starting out. Um, there's a few people who are looking for more possibilities. And I guess those who are just starting out are also in that, that, um, that uh, uh, category as well. And um, we've got yeah, one organisation, one group that's got a single session. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, so look, I'll, I'll kick right into especially, I guess, for people who are dealing with, with those early stages, so maybe they're looking for more sites or they're just starting out. Um, we'll just start out there ourselves. Um, really, this is a process um, we've gone through um, these two polls. But I want to talk through the funnel and the filter. So as you can see here, we've got, we've got a channel, a filter on the screen. You are, Tom, just making sure everyone can see the slides. Yep. Is that? Yep, that's perfect. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it can be really challenging. I, for a little while, actually worked with a professional organisation um, and my, my entire role there was just to find them sites to build large-scale solar farms. Um, and I was quite confused setting out about how to deal with what I saw as a very complex problem, how to kind of narrow in the right sites, how to get rid of the, um, the ones I didn't like. And um, what, what unfortunately, um, just I guess my own personal type of learning that and this, this may be a problem that many of you share. I, I'm, I'm a kind of a technical guy. I'm interested in detail. I have more of a networks engineering type background. And what I would tend to do, and I'd like to caution you all away from, is that I would look for sites just based on some of those um, technical aspects that I knew quite well. So I would often look out for ones that I thought had a good grid connection. And I'd often spend quite a lot of time looking into the grid connection um, without giving equal weighting and time and importance to the myriad of other uh, facets that might make a site a good or a bad one. And I could end up only months later discovering that while that site had a great good connection, that it had a, had a very fatal flaw in, in something that I would have discovered in 10 minutes of investigation, perhaps on, say, biodiversity or fatal flaw that I might have discovered in 10 minutes of investigation on, um, on zoning. And so... Maybe it's a flood, a flood zone or something. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And there are many things which are fatal flaws. And 
the process that I'd really encourage anyone to follow is start with a really broad funnel. Um, and we'll talk about a couple of ways to broaden your funnel in, in a second. Um, and maybe have in the order of 50 or 60 sites in, in your top layer of your, your funnel. And then to apply very quick and dirty um, uh, screens on those for almost every criteria that you, you are aware of um, to quickly identify um, within sort of a 10 minute check on each, okay, what's the biodiversity like? What's the heritage like? What's the zoning like? What's my first 10 minute guess of grid connection? What do I think the owner's likely to be amenable to? What, what other um, businesses might the owner have that are more valuable to, to them than having a solar farm on board? And by doing that, you can, um, and here's the key bit, you can discard many sites early because site selection really is not about finding sites. It's about getting rid of bad ones and then the, the good ones will filter out at the bottom. And that's really what I'd like to, I guess, encourage as, as the methodology, which I think can work quite well for you as you progress. And then maybe you've kind of narrowed that down to maybe in the, a handful, perhaps in the order of three to 10. And at that point, you'd, you'd put in a little bit more, um, more effort and go to a little bit more detail on just that reduced number because there's nothing worse than doing what I did and going into a great depth of detail on one or two facets of the, um, the, the feasibility of a site and realizing that you've wasted all that effort because you haven't done fatal floor analysis on the other criteria. Finally, after you've dropped down to maybe a single or maybe just one or two sites, um, you then need to think about those being already a fairly good bet for spending your um, limited budget on um, for actually doing the more expensive due diligence approval steps. And there are, of course, uh, formal grid connection studies that um, are particularly those sites in the kind of 100 to um, 1 megawatt range and also, of course, the 30 megawatts and above that you'll need to spend money on. Um, you may also need to spend time and money talking to landowners and going through legal agreements. And it's really a pain to do that kind of stuff if you haven't ticked off all the other um, basic screening test tests first. And, and you will waste time and if you have, um, unfortunately, a fatal flaw that you only find far too late down the path. And of course, at the end, pops your, um, pops your wind turbine or your solar farm that you're working on. So Lawrence, is this is this um, relevant to a particular scale of development, or does it does it would apply to re really as long as you're doing a sort of commercial installation, you, you need to take this sort of approach? Look, this should apply to I think all of you, whether or not whether or not you're, you're dealing with the 10 kilowatt scale, or and, and especially of course if you're dealing with the 30 megawatt scale, the types of criteria you'll have to sort out good sites from bad sites will change across those scales. Yeah. But the general final approach, I think, is, is still very valid across those. Yeah, and I, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a critical mindset you need to adopt rather than an optimistic mindset and yeah. trying to figure out the reasons early on <laughs> why mm. some, uh, locations won't work, not why they wouldn't And that work. can be painful because it can be a little baby location that, that you have. You've got a great relationship with the owner of that building and you feel really excited about it. Um, but good filtering is about getting rid of sites quickly as opposed to trying to hold on to them. So um, just remember that as you go through. And to speak to those people particularly, I think there were some people that had a limited number of sites that were looking to expand their options and also some people that were just starting out. So I'll talk a little bit to how to go about and identify um, a large number of sites. Um, and look, that bit's really easy, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's, it's a bit of grunt work, but you start with a spreadsheet. Um, you, you, with your team, um, start thinking along the lines of certain um, important criteria. So, for example, let's say you're in the, somewhere in the 10 to 100 kilowatt range. Um, you're interested, of course, um, in... And this is, this is another aspect which I think um, is worth, worth pointing out. You're interested, of course, in somewhere that's sunny. But what you're really interested in there is differentiating between someone that's sunny and somewhere that's not. So if you're in an area of flat paddocks and they're all the same sunlight, that's not a useful criteria for you to be able to sort out sites. You want to sort out sites that um, have a differentiation on a particular criteria. So if there are some sites that are really shaded, then that's good. That's a good way to filter them out. But if everyone's the same sunlight, you have a different criteria to fill there. You want to be saying, okay, what's the owner likely to be like here? Are they likely to be interested in a long-term um, power purchase agreement or are they only renting for three years? So I need to cut them out pretty, pretty early based on the owner's land tenure there. Um, one way of going about it is, is, is finding a, a resolutely difficult set of criteria and getting into your maps, which we'll be talking about a little bit later in, in um, this talk, and starting to identify on your maps what types of properties um, you think will be really good 
Um, so one, one thing that we're, um, or I've been quite conscious of recently is, is things like hospitals and public institutions for your rooftop project, because um, ultimately, um, just through my own experience, I've found that to, start to find someone that's interested in the PPA, um, there are plenty of good rooftops, plenty of good sites, but there are less good sites in terms of the owner and the ownership structure of someone that's interested in a long term. Um, so I, I might have someone approach me that says, look, look, Laurie, I've got this car yard, it's great, great roof. Do you want to come and put solar on it? And what I'm really interested in, I won't bother about technical analysis or anything. I'll get straight to the point and say, look, how long, like, do you own this building? Are you interested in a 10 year investment? Because I often find that um, that's going to be the deal breaker for so many people. I don't want to talk to them about all the other stuff. I just want to know if that's going to break their, break their idea first. And then if, they, if they're okay with that, we can have a further conversation about some of the other types of um, tests that might see if they're a good, um, if they're a good site. But we'll talk more about broadening when we get to the maps in just a little while. Cool. Um, here are some of the things that you might be interested in um, as your criteria. And I, I guess we're recording this, aren't we, Tom? So these, this whole slide will be available later on for you. Yep. Um, and some of these are available uh, for, for everybody. Um, and some of these are only relevant to people doing rooftops. So you see on the top right there, um, some that are only relevant really for rooftops and similarly some that are only really relevant for ground mounted installations down the bottom. Um, a number of these will be a surprise potentially to people. Um, so I'll just talk through each of them briefly as um, if I think they're relevant. Um, you of course need to know where it is. Having the lot and DP number, um, I think that's a New South Wales terminology, but every, every state uh, jurisdiction or, or territory jurisdiction has a, a means by which they legally identify land, package, land packages. You'll need that later on when you're talking to council, when you're fulfilling out applications. So find it early. Uh, we'll talk about how to find it too in, in, um, uh, a little later on. Um, area, of course, is important. You're probably very familiar with that if you're in, into solar. Um, similarly, in wind, you're obviously looking at wind resource, solar resource, climate zoning. It's really easy to find, um, and I'll show you a tool later on for a couple of states where you can find zoning. I don't think anyone will be surprised with the owner favourability. Um, local community favourability, remember, it's not just your community investing that's local community. There might be others nearby that would feel impacted by it, and they might be a slightly different community than an investor community. So don't, don't forget that it could be um, a separate people, set of people you need to approach from your normal audience there. Um, part of owner favourability, I'm just going to go across into land value, number 19, is that you need to think about what the owner might otherwise do with that. Maybe they're a sheep farmer, it's pretty dry, and they might only earn a few hundred dollars off the land from running sheep. Um, or maybe they've got a, a, really, um, a really promising opportunity, which is much higher than the value of lease you might be prepared to pay. So think about what kind of business is operated there already, what kind of use they have for the space. And if they've got a high value use for the space, you might be able to rule that out quite early based on the fact that someone else is going to find a reason to pay more for that space than, than otherwise you would be prepared to. Um, things like vehicular access. Uh, often dealing at really large solar farms, if you're dealing with a ground mount or something, having a tarred road is, is actually quite important. And similarly having something which is slightly off a, um, a national road, because uh, if you're dealing with something which is on a major access route, like a highway or even state controlled roads, um, or sorry, federally, federally controlled roads, then the types of um, turning lanes that you may have to put in for access to site can actually end up being surprisingly quite expensive. So do pay attention to what kind of access road you have and be beware of major roads um, appropriateness in that, in that sense. Um, grid connection, I don't think it'd be a surprise to anyone. Shading won't be a surprise to anyone who's solar. solar. Um, and I don't think any of the, uh, for the rooftop should be a surprise to anyone. Um, and I don't expect any of the, um, the ones in ground mounted would be a surprise to anyone either. But we will talk a little bit about some of those later as well. Um, so feel free to raise your hand for any questions if you think there are other criteria. I don't think it's an exhaustive list, but it's a pretty good first pass assessment um, and you can use. So let's talk about some of your tools for analysing fatal flaws. Um, so we've got um, six mapping type packages here. And actually, um, Tom, at this stage, we'll be able to run that third poll. I just want to get an idea if any of anyone's used these kinds of packages before. And I, I, I guess some of them probably have, but um, if we could set that up. And, That's up now. <clears throat> um, so I expect you're most familiar with Google Maps and also the Google Street View product. Um, six Max and Map, Map, Act, Map I only apply in the ACT in New South Wales, but you may have, they're, they're the, um, the state and territory um, published uh, development mapping portals. So if you're in Victoria or Queensland or, or further afield, um, 
you won't be familiar with either of these, but you may have a, a similar state government um, mapping platform. So just yes on that if, if it's a different state that you're in, but you're familiar with that state government mapping platform. Um, and then we've got things like QGIS, NearMap, and of course a Remy that we'll be covering um, in a little bit more detail uh, in just a little while as that's the, the thrust of the work we've been doing at ISF. How's that poll going, Todd? I think we're pretty much there. I'm going to end it there. So, Wonderful. last chance. Okay, and there's the results. Okay, so look, strong familiarity with Google Suites, um, moderate familiarity with state government polls, and pretty much no use of near maps. Oh, I put near map in there twice. That was silly of me. I'm really sorry. That should have been. Um, that should have been straight. It doesn't matter. Um, there should have been one for QGIS in there. Apologies, doesn't matter. Um, okay, look, I won't spend a lot of time on Google um, and I won't spend, sorry, what was the other one? It was the state government one. I'll introduce a little bit about what state government ones can provide, um, but essentially um, I'll focus on some of the ones that people aren't as familiar with. Um, so this one you see here is a little bit of a state government one, but and this is the biodiversity layer of the ACT suburb of Hume, um, where I can... I can click on things like fish and protective species, invertebrates, frogs, mammals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and different, different states have different quality in the kinds of ones they present here. I've also got um, six maps loaded up here. Um, so this is the New South Wales portal. And this is in either of these, in the ACT or the New South Wales one, and I, I strongly expect the other state government ones, this is where it's the easiest to find your, your zoning. So this is your lot and DP number. Um, and I believe there are also zoning overlays that you can access. So um, if I, I might not be able to click on that. Um, but essentially, sorry, I'm just gonna zoom out a little bit here. Um, essentially your state government maps are, are where you find that as well as where you should look for things like light industrial versus you know residential versus rural versus zone for future um, improvement. And something in the light utility, um, or, or rural, or there, and there are various grades of rural, is, is usually where you want to aim for a, a ground-mounted installation. Um, and it's not as important if you're dealing with something small um, on a rooftop because you're zoning all of you that rooftop. Um, I'm going to just talk briefly about some of these other ones then. Um, near map is by far the best for really close shots from, from aerial photography. So for people dealing with rooftops, this may be one of your best tools to use to really get an idea of site conditions prior to visiting it. And this is a site, you can actually make out the three conductors of a power line over this site. And you can make out individual bricks on the house that's under construction in this shot. Um, it's, it's fantastic. Um, however, you will pay for it. Uh, it it's, it's an annual subscription um, that you will need to, um, to have a budget for if you want to access it. Um, probably next best in terms of, of aerial photography is a Remy, and we will talk about that later. Um, and then finally, um, QGIS is a, a bit of software. It's free. It's very good. Um, you can download it, and you need a little practice with it, but you can bring in map layers from um, lots and lots of different sources. See, in fact, you can use all the Remy layers through QGIS. You can often use state government layers through QGIS, and that just sort of saves you the, the problem of changing from one map to view this important facet about lot and DP numbers and zoning and then looking at the other map to kind of figure out, you know, what your, your grid connection might be. It's kind of useful to have it all in the one map with all the overlays. You're interested in. Something like QGIS is where you'll need to go if you want to see a holistic view of all the types of um, constraints and filters that you're interested in. Um, and I just want to, Street View has become a very um, interesting tool for me. I just want to show you what so there's two things on Street View I want to point out. You're probably aware of this, but Google's got a really great 3D image for people dealing with rooftops. Once again, some some areas have developed a 3D elevation. Um, so I can actually do something like this, and hopefully that'll come through on your screens. But I can go up and down. I can see the height of trees nearby um, a solar plant or a rooftop that I might be interested in, um, and I can just get a feel for what something looks like on the ground as opposed to just dealing with a top-down image. So that's on Google, and you can do this kind of thing just by holding either your command or your control key and, and zooming around with the mouse. So that can be really handy. Um, the other thing is, um, supposing I was interested in a site in Goulburn, um, that's why I've got this one up from before, we're, we're in Goulburn here, we're just on a little bit of area. It's, this is actually floodplain, so it's a bad site, but um, what I just want to show you is that if you're identifying anything on the ground, um, you may, hopefully you can see these shadows, these kind of stick-like shadows and it's a great way to identify power poles and follow them across the map, um, which can help you establish your grid connection feasibility. 
And you'll see here, we've got all these power poles going along. Um, they're kind of tracking from the bottom left of my screen across this highway and up towards the top right. And grid connection is something I'm going to be very interested in, of course. Um, but I, and part of that is knowing what kind of capacity these, lines, these mines, lines may have. And this is where I want to combine something with a good um, aerial image. Um, and this is a better aerial image than, than Google Maps has with something that I can see on the ground. So I, and I'm sure you're familiar with this, but um, I'm just going to drag my little street view man um, right down there and put him down. And now I can actually see the three conductors of each of these and I can zoom in, which is really fun, I reckon. And <laughs> the, here's, a little, here's a little trick that, that um, is important to know. The, the voltage of lines, of power lines like these, um, is proportional to the length of the... Can you see my mouse? Is that... Yep. Tom, can you see my mouse? Yep. All right. So length of these things here called the isolators um, is a really good proxy for the voltage of the lines. So this is quite a high voltage line. This one's um, medium to low. So when I say high, that'll be in the order of 132 kilovolts. It could be 66, but I don't think it is. Um, it may even be as high as 220. Something like this, however, you can barely make out like the isolators. Um, that'll be in the order of 11, 22 or 33 kilovolts. So that may be an appropriate connection scale for your megawatt plant. This one over here, um, 132 would not be far too big to be useful. And then we've got one over here, which is kind of in the middle. I reckon that may be a 66 instead of the far right one over there. <laughs> and so you can follow your power lines around, um, see, see how far they are from the zone substation. And you can use this kind of Google Street View to actually get a really good assessment, um, especially for these lower voltage lines, of what kind of um, capacity they may have. Um, but, uh, and this is a really good segue um, into this, the tool we've recently building, been building at a Remy, um, particularly for some of those larger connections. We had someone interested in the 30 megawatt plan, I remember. So we'll talk about how Remy's useful, um, both at a small scale, not so much for power line capacity, um, but it's also very useful for um, some of the zoning aspects that we'll get to in environmental aspects. Um, and a Remy was uh, becoming even more and more useful for people dealing with large connections. So on to what we've been doing at ISF. Um, it's a project um, called the Network Opportunity Maps. And um, most of the talk, I'll just, I'll just spend plugging what we've been working on. But essentially, it's, it's down to two things. It's looking at you help, uh, helping you assess um, one of the key uh, failing criteria of many, many projects is network connection. Um, costs of this can be hard, they can be surprising, they can come up late in the piece. Um, yeah, look, I, in fact, I've just been dealing with a network connection um, agreement this afternoon and we had um, we had quite a, a good um, connection proposal for a while and then at the sort of the 10th hour, it went up about $1.4 million um, and then just recently it came down, um, you know, back to the original level after a bit of pushing and you really need to be vigilant, vigilant and understand your network connection and be able to, to negotiate fairly firmly with the network provider. Um, because network providers, um, as you can see in this, the network costs are quite a lot of um, electricity bills. And um, network costs, they are locationally specific and they're time specific. So when a network has to build something, it's in a specific location, they've got to do it because of the constraint that might only exist for 5% of the year in the peak summer days or in the peak winter days. And part of what we've been doing at ISF is helping you identify where these constraints may exist. And some of them you may even be able to help support the network from not having to build that out. And we'll talk a little bit how the maps can do that in just a second. Awesome. Uh, um, so these, these maps are really here to answer these questions. Where are the most cost effective opportunities for um, your plant in terms of its connection? Um, distributed, can, energy, distributed energy? Yeah, sorry, distributed yeah. energy. Yeah. Yeah, your, um, where could your distributed energy actually help the electricity network from avoiding costs and therefore it could earn maybe a separate revenue streams for offering network support type arrangements? Um, what times of day, year um, are these likely constraints going to, going to occur and, and how can you assist in avoiding them? Um, and what areas simply just under normal operations, they might not be constrained at all um, and really be a great place to connect the new generator. Um, so you know, into um, just briefly about Look to thank all the, our partners. There's been a lot in developing this, um, but I'll go into explaining how the layers um, work. Um, this is all available right now online, um, and it's at, you can probably see in my browser, nationalmap.gov.au slash renewables. Do you want to quickly um, explain what a REMI is or what the national map is? No worries. Um, the national map is an Australian federal government platform that's developed by, um, now part of CSIRO called Data61. 
and it's for lots of different mapping tools um, that you may want to use. And renewables forward slash um, takes you to the Australian Renewable Energy Mapping Infrastructure, a REMI. And this has been put together um, by so many people providing data. There's over, there's over 700 different databases that support the kinds of information you can access here. And the ones I'll be talking you through today are mostly the, the five to 10 of those databases which uh, have been worked on um, by us at the ISF, particularly around network constraints and about connecting your renewable energy generator. Um, so to use it, it's, it's very simple. You, um, you click on your add data button on the left. I mean, feel free to actually load this up and follow along if, if you, you would like to. Um, but I'm going to um, click on add data here. And let's say I'm interested in a solar farm um, near Goulburn. We'll go with the same, same kind of example. Um, and we want to find somewhere that's got obviously a big enough area for my, you know, my one megawatt plan or my 30 megawatt plan. So it's not just good enough kind of scouring Google Earth because I can't really tell where land boundaries are on Google Earth. Um, and I only really want to talk to one farmer. I don't want to sort of talk to 10 farmers who all just happen to own little lots in an area. So that's where things like cadastral parcels come in really handy. So I'm going to turn on my cadastral parcels layer. And these are all the legal land barriers around the whole country. And I'm going to just zoom in um, on some area here. And if I, um, if I find a good area, so look, here's a, here's a nice block of land, I think. Um, Let's go a little bit left and go in a little bit more. Carrick, that's exactly the one I want. Yeah. So this one actually is, I, I know our commercial solar developers actually now earmark this for their own farm. But, um, okay, so here we are at, at a place called Carrick and we're going to click on this block of land here and we can see it's actually quite large and it's already got a um, boundary that we can see from the start. And that we, we can actually quite visually sort out little annoying small parcels like that as one that's not worth approaching. We can just go for the big ones because we want a big site. And it tells me the area. Wow, 980 hectares. It's huge. This may be one for the 30 megawatt guy that um, lives on the line. Um, once I've sort of found a good site, I may be interested in some other layers. And I'll, I'll focus in on um, our layers that we've been working on with ISF. Um, but in particular, um, there are environmental constraints here that you can look into about world heritage areas. So you can quickly scan for if something's got um, a referral under the EPBC Act, which means you can pretty much um, expect a lot of expense if you want to continue on development there. <laughs> um, and you know, you've got your boundaries topography. So you want something which is relatively flat. You want something that's relatively, uh, well, I guess if you're a solar farm, sorry, I'm just a solar developer naturally. So if we want more wind focus, we can do that too. Um, topography, you know, your contour is making sure it's not too up and down, making sure the vegetation is not too um, requiring, requiring a clearing. Um, and then we're going to go into, um, there's, there's two types here, renewable energy. So this is existing plants that you may be interested in. Um, and then secondarily, electricity infrastructure. So this is where our work has been um, at ISF. And I'm going to go to network opportunities. And there's five main layers here, which we'll talk through. Um, in, the, in the remaining time just before questions. So available distribution capacity, don't be misled here. This is capacity left to connect new load to the, the network. Um, and I might just put that on. So I just put the plus sign here next to the layer and that'll come up. And with any luck, I should get a polygon layer. Oh, I might just switch to 2D. Um, so most of our layers are, are 2D layers only. So I may just have to... Um, have that coming in 2D. But available distribution capacity, it's useful for you if you think you can help support the electricity network from um, uh, avoiding the need to augment itself. So if maybe you've got a battery associated with your installation and you think that um, if there's somewhere with low further capacity to accept load, your generation will help balance that out. So that can be really handy for you. Um, and all, all these look like they've got pretty similar available distribution capacity. So it's not a useful filter for me in this case. Um, to go ahead and, and discern a site. Uh, I'll just turn that layer off, um, which you just do on the right here. I'll remove that. Um, so we're going to go to the next one. Proposed investment. Okay, cool. This is where one we can find out if the network is interested in um, investing in their network in the future. Once again, they're looking to spend money. And if they can spend money on an alternative solution, like, a, like your solar or wind farm with its battery that can help them not have to spend that money, um, then you may have an opportunity there. And I'm actually going to go to one I prepared earlier which is in Proserpine. Um, so I'll just turn off. Uh, oh, this is good. This is good. So I've got my proposed investment layer. I'll turn off that one for now. And I'll turn off um, this one as well. 
So this is simply a whole bunch of dots that we see where someone's thinking about investing sometime soon. And zooming in a little bit, all right, where is, where's Proserpine? Um, I think it's, I should know this, I've been there enough recently. Um, I'll have to bring it back in a second. All right, we'll just, I think it might be this one. Um, so here's a proposed investment that someone's, and this is, um, this is Powerlink that's going to be working on this, I believe. No, Ergon Energy. And so you can see that they're looking about investing in 2019. Okay, so maybe if I can, if I can get a project underway quickly there, and this is some of those much larger projects, I might be able to help. Um, and we can then see um, a further layer that's called annual deferral value. So this is how much every year the network um, has to spend as an amortized cost. So annually, it's as if they spent this much money every year um, to put in that augmentation. And if you can help avoid that, then that might be this, the share of money that you might be able to approach if you're a big enough project to help them actually defer that cost. So I'm gonna turn on annual deferral value. Okay, now I'm pretty sure I know where Proserpine is. So this here has a high annual deferral value. So they've got an immediate nut coming expense that if you can help defer, that's gonna be worth money for you. So here we are um, at the Cannonvale substation. All right, they're, not, they're talking about investing in 2020. That's interesting. And you can access here some of their planning report and even get in touch with them if you'd like to know more about what's going on. And one more dot, like in the polygon. Um, okay, so here you can see actually they're spending um, in 2018 coming to 2020, um, what's worth about $80, $84 per KVA per year. So to put that in context, supposing you were to help them avoid all of that um, because you had a project that was um, big enough for the right kind of time of generation, um, to help them avoid that. Um, if that was a megawatt in project, well, 1,000 1, kilowatts times $84 uh, becomes $84,000 a year that you might be able to help in helping them deferring that, um, that cost. Then you could, you could uh, negotiate with them regarding network support payments for that kind of thing. Okay, so we're talking about Proserpine here. What about the ability to connect though? If they've got this kind of constraint, can we actually find an area which nonetheless has enough capacity for our, our, our plant. So I'm going to turn both of those off and I'm going to put on transmission power lines. Okay, interesting. There's a power line in this area. That's good. I'm going to click on that and discover it's a 132 kV power line. So this is maybe my, my 30 megawatt plant level. Um, or maybe I'd have to connect in directly into that, that phone substation there. Um, I'll just turn off this one. Okay, but what about the capacity to connect? Um, so that's one more layer in our, in our maps. And in this case, I'm going to add transmission substations in. I'm going to find out what kind of capacity this transmission substation may have for our project. So there's Proserpine. All right. So here's a... Now this, with all the information we're showing here, the network's put it up in a partner to this because they intended to be a conversation starter. So they've done their best to put up current and useful information, but they've, they've made it pretty clear in some of the disclaimers that you can access um, if you want to you click on the About and Starter set. But they intended as a conversation starter, so please... Um, use it that way. Use it to identify what you think is promising steps, but before you commit to the site, do your medium scale screening steps, get in touch with them at the network and ask them what they've considered in their, in their assessment. So um, I've actually kicked on a power line. I want the, I want the substation. Um, okay, so here we find that they think they can maybe accept about 75 megawatts of generation at this, this. So that actually becomes a really good kind of trifecta of somewhere with plenty of room for new generation, but also a near and present and upcoming constraint that you may be able to help if you build the right kind of generator that's able to dispatch at the right kind of times to, to help capture the value of this, this, um, this brightly coral area, which indicates a, a near and upcoming um, expense by, in this case, either Ergon Energy or by PowerLink. Um, I'll also just point out the, the slider down the bottom. Um, so we've got this, um, this time sensitive issue where it's only going to come about in 2019 or 2020. What does it look like after that? What does it look like before that? And so um, just wanted to highlight these controls down the bottom when you can um, move forward and backward in time to assess when and where that, const that constraint might come about. And if I zoom out a little bit, I should be able to um, just press um, fast forward on that. Uh, Okay, so here, here we've got a slider. So it's not much going on in 2016. I'll slide it forward. I'm sliding it forward to 2019. Right, there it is, so 2019 and beyond that. Um, 
So if you know about the time horizon of your project, you might use this another way to kind of filter what you're interested in. But because we're all mostly community energy proponents here, I'm going to assume your area is fairly known. Like you're not going to be looking around the whole country for your site. You're going to be interested in your local area. Um, and I'll just show you what some of the, the sites um, and useful layers are for some of those smaller generation sets. So we'll turn all these ones off and we'll go to the, um, the distribution um, substations and power lines. Uh, I can shift and add them both at once. And I am going to be interested in New South Wales just for this demo. We'll go back to Goulburn potentially. It could be, um, it could be a good area to go to. Takes a little while to add. Um, just by the way, I've turned on a black background here to make it, I'm actually colorblind, so I find it really hard to see the dots um, and the, the line colors unless it's a very, very um, high contrasted background. But you've got lots of other options here if you want to turn on um, satellite views or uh, cartographic views. Um, but unfortunately, I just find it too hard to see. So I'm going to stick with my relatively boring black background and I'll put that away. Um, so here we are, we're in a central energy network now. Um, and don't be, don't be too alarmed by the cut. So red, of course, normally means bad and blue would normally mean good. But remember to pick a size of, of generation connection um, asset uh, that's appropriate for your generator. So like we talked about before, we had those very high voltage power lines and they're fine if you're building 30 megawatts, but that'll be a horribly expensive connection if you're trying to build one or 200 kilowatts. So finding some of these areas that are in the sort of one to three or three to five range or even zero to one, might actually be just right for your generator, which is of that kind of size range. Um, so the lines here, uh, we're just gonna go um, back down to Goulburn. There we are, okay. Um, so I'm gonna zoom right into Goulburn. And um, Goulburn, Goulburn's interesting. So this, there's a couple of things on this. One is line thickness is proportional to voltage. So you've already got a signal for you about um, but the voltage of the lines are very thick ones, probably not so good for a one megawatt connection. These thinner ones, your distribution feeders, um, they could be quite promising. And I think this is a 33 kV line, if I'm not mistaken. So just clicking on it brings up some detailed information. It's a 66, okay, with 61 megawatts of capacity. That's not bad if you've got 61 megawatts that you're hoping to, um, to deploy. What about, I'm just gonna zoom in further. And what, what have I got here? Um, that's, a, that's a 66 as well. Okay. I was hoping to find a 33, uh, but I have not. I'm sorry. Um, but nonetheless, remember to pick an asset size that's right for your type of generator. And then you can go in and say, look, maybe this side up here maybe is, is really good. So let's start looking at, let's start adding in the environmental layers we had before. Let's start adding in the zoning layers. Let's start adding in those property boundary layers. And I'm gonna add in one right now, just for fun. We'll get a cadastral land layer in. Layer in. Um, cadastral land tenure, that's what we'd like. And cadastral parcels, please. Okay, so look, I was hoping for something right there. Oh, look at that, it's not actually a bad block of land. If I, um, and remember, of course, you don't have to use the whole block of land. You can, of course, negotiate with a farmer to have just a, a portion of their property. Um, you can see even here an easement around the power line so that between, you know, about five metres or 10 metres of the side is, is reserved area for that power line. So, look, I won't go any more detail at the moment, but just remember you've got these, these five layers now that you can use um, to help you assess what the grid connection might be like and whether or not you can extract extra value through helping um, support a, a grid connection um, constraint or some other constraint that we might be facing with actually helping them to assist their problem. Um, so that's the end of the, the demonstration I'm going to give on a Remy. Um, there are further slides here with, with various examples of that, um, but they're pretty much what I've just shown you. And I think I always think it's more interesting. Um, one note about zone substation available capacity for demand, that it, it takes into account the load, for, load forecast in the future. And this is once again where you can see an area with increasing load in the future. Maybe if you're able to increase the generation there at the right times of day and year, you can actually help them avoid that constraint. Um, and we'll skip forward. Uh, we've talked about the amplifier value and um, that's been the live demo. So um, I'd like to just, I know it's very conscious that we've only got 10 uh, minutes left. So um, what I'd like to do really is open up for questions um, and yeah, help focus the rest of the time on what you'd actually like to know about if there's any more of detail that you'd like to know. 
Thanks, Lawrence. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, uh, I, I guess for, so, people, please get your questions in. We've we've only got one question there so far, which I'll jump to in one second. Um, but yeah, I've just got to say, there's a lot more there than I was expecting, and you know, you've given us so much more than just a view to your mapping solution. You obviously have a lot of experience doing the solar solar development work. So thank you so much for that. It's really really amazing to see hear your insights. Um, uh, Liam has asked, uh, there's a lot of mapping work to be done. Um, what would be the best way for a GIS analyst to link up with community energy groups to offer my services? Um, I can have a go at answering that, but Laurie, what are your thoughts? Uh, I'd probably leave it to organisations like, um, like the Community Power Agency, of course, that, that you're from, Tom, um, but also organisations like Embark, although I, I think, as I understand, they might be scaling more of the community engagement through, um, through people like Community Power Agency. But um, you may find one in your local area too. I mean, the, the best bit of community energy is, of course, it's the community there. So if you've got a local community, um, depending on, of course, where you are, then helping them get up, get set up with things like QGIS, setting, setting things up with ways to access these layers um, in a way that helps them really quickly filter in good sites uh, and investing or helping them invest time um, and invest skills in a particular person within their own team that can get good at this. Um, it's invaluable. It really is. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's right. Um, so yeah, probably the best place to go would actually be the Coalition for Community Energy C four C U dot dot net dot au. Um, there's actually a closed members only Facebook group. So if you want to send an email to secretariat at c four c dot net dot au, um, I'm happy to put a notice out there, and I'm sure that you'll get an enthusiastic response from a bunch of people. Or if that doesn't look like the right way for you, then um, just 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 let's start up a, an, an email conversation um, about that. So um, I've got a question. Um, a bunch of stuff there was. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't too much at all, Laurie. But there was there was a bunch of sort of technical, almost jargon type stuff. Which, which Sorry. Yeah. no, no, no. no what, I don't feel it was too much. But what I, what I, what I'm interested in is where can people go to? Have you developed any documentation that goes with the network opportunity mapping work? Where can people go to to become more familiar with some of the terminology you're using around things yeah, like KVA and and particularly there was a lot of tacit knowledge that you had which maybe won't be in the documentation, but maybe it is. So no, it's a fair question. Um, so look, just so focusing on the Uremi layers. So this is just because it's in our tool. I know there's lots of other stuff we talked about in other map um, mm. about about um, things. And I think I, I, I don't know much about the state government um, or as much about the state government portals. Uh, however, with Uremi, every single layer. So here's our one on distribution power lines. Yeah. Uh, every single layer has about this layer, which I'll bring up now, just to talk you through. Um, so it talks a little bit about. Uh, sorry, um, it talks a little bit about essentially who's put it together and why. Um, a bit of obvious stuff about the colour scale, about some of the things, but further down, um, you get uh, quite a, a useful description of every... When you might remember I clicked on a, on a um, box and I also clicked on a line and I got quite a detailed um, display of some interesting information about that site. Yeah. Um, every single field in there is described um, in this about this layer um, and it'll help you uh, hopefully zone in on what's useful and what's not um, for uh, whatever's relevant in that layer. So here it's about generation connection capacity, um, talks about uh, the types of substations that you may see, um, little shorthand codes which say transmission line or terminal substation actually tells you what, so a terminal substation being the boundary between a big transmission company and, a, and the more smaller distribution companies, um, well outside the, the, the usefulness though to someone developing um, anything lower than maybe a 20 megawatt plant though. So it helps you identify that maybe it's a distribution substation, the distribution lines that become most relevant to community energy components. Mm -hmm. um, and then descriptions about things like um, voltage, what it means, what the connection capacity means, a little bit about how it's calculated in this particular networks area. And just be warned that each network calculates it differently. And it talks about some of the... Um, some of the things they've used here when they've been assessing what what to put in these maps. And once again, I want to stress that they see it as a conversation starter. So please get in touch with them early, um, early and often in the process, get a good relationship going with them um, because otherwise you might be caught on the back foot if you engage with them early. 
Sure, sure. And some of the tacit knowledge or the sort of the knowledge that you just had, you just have like, you know, certain size lines, a 30, uh, 30, 133 kV line is only going to be uh, suitable for a certain size of generator. I was going to have an expensive connection fee if, you, if you're too small. Where, where, where could you point people for, for information about that? Gosh, I don't know, Tom. So that, that, that knowledge is kind of me because I used to work for both a, a network company um, accepting generator connection proposals and doing the, the actual modelling around whether or not they would work. Um, and then after that, working for a, um, a company that was, I guess, on the other side of that equation, we were looking for sites to put them. Um, so I, it comes from conversations with um, your network company, but also you can use these maps to gather familiarity with that too. So you can see here that this is a, um, it was a 66 kV line. That could be going on. Yeah, um, sorry about that. That's all right. Um, and you can start to gauge a little bit around, okay, um, this 66, it's not likely to have much more than maybe, maybe six. so what one, one very basic rule of thumb is that um, you might expect to find um, a little bit more than the voltage. So if you think about your voltage being 66, you might find up to a little bit more than that being your available connection capacity in megawatts, uh, which is, it's a very, very quick and dirty rule of thumb and many, many sites break this and there are many which are much more constrained than that. But, having a 66 kV area, which was able to accept, you know, hundreds of megawatts, I, I'd be quite surprised. Um, people, um, people can use that as a bit of a rule of thumb, but once again, talk to the network company early. Um, but also just sort of, I'll just turn the cadastral layer off just so it loads a bit quicker. Um, let me turn that off. So getting a bit of an idea, if I just look at this and go, look, that's a really thick line. So thickness is, is a voltage um, indicator. It's also yep. got a lot of, a lot of capacity. What this, of course, doesn't tell you about is what cost might be you might be up for to connect to that, um, and that one that might, might, might once again be a conversation to have with your with your network company. Um, but really, anyone dealing up to about a megawatt in size, um, avoid anything over over thirty three kilo, kilovolts. So that's the kind of lowest distribution feeders. Um, and if you're dealing in, of course, a ten or a hundred kilowatt um, scale something that's relatively close to the, the transformer down the street, which you can see on Google Maps Street View. You can sort of follow your, your power lines, look for your transformer, um, and make sure you're not just too far away from that because that will add sometimes to the types of constraints you face. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, we've got no more questions, so and we're out of time. So we're gonna wrap this up in the allotted hour, which is perfect. Um, thank you so much, Lawrence, it's, yeah, clear that you've got a lot of knowledge there and you've shared a lot more than just the maps with us and that's really helpful and really valuable um, no worries. yeah and um, look everybody else um, thanks for joining us for all these webinars we hope you've enjoyed them and we we'll look forward to bringing you uh, more in the new year um, probably later in the year um, and um, yeah we hope you found them valuable and um, Looks like we've finished the year on a, on a high note with this with this pretty awesome mapping webinar. And uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. All right, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm.